Hello everyone. Um, my name is Caitlin and I am hosting this event tonight on behalf of Goldfields Libraries and would like to welcome you all to what promises to be a wonderful evening. Just quickly um, before we kick off, as you may be able to hear in my voice, I have a cold. Um, I'm going to try my best not to sneeze into my mic, but apologies in advance if that does happen. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that, as always, when we gather on the land of so-called Australia, tonight we are on stolen country. I am on unceded Jara land, which is where I live and work, and I pay my deepest respects to its traditional and rightful custodians, the Jar Jar Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I extend my respects to the communities and elders, past and present, of all the lands that this event reaches tonight. Before I introduce Judy Nunn, I would also like to quickly give a shout out to another Judy who I believe is here in the audience tonight. This Judy is a huge Judy Nunn fan and is tuning into this talk tonight for her first ever Zoom to celebrate her 80th birthday. So a special welcome and happy birthday to Judy. It is also my honor, of course, to introduce Judy Nunn. Judy's career has been long, illustrious and multifaceted. After combining her internationally successful acting career with script writing for television and radio, Judy decided in the 90s to turn her hand to prose. Her first three novels, The Glitter Game, Center Stage and Araluen, set respectively in the worlds of television, theater and film, became instant bestsellers and the rest is history, quite literally in fact. She has since developed a love of writing Australian historically based fiction and her fame as a novelist has spread rapidly throughout Europe, where she is published in English, German, French, Dutch, Czech, and Spanish. She has now sold over 1 million books in Australia alone. And in 2015, Judy was made a member of the Order of Australia. Judy joins us tonight to talk about her latest novel, Showtime. Welcome, Judy. Oh, my God, that was a terribly long introduction. Um, <laughs> thanks, Caitlin, and thanks all you guys for turning up. I'm so thrilled to see you and to get the wave and all. It's wonderful. Great to be here. And uh, particularly where you are, which is a very important area to the book. Right. So shall I just soldier on here? C Caitlin, yes, good. Uh, because you see... Um, Bendigo and all of your area where you are, of course, is, well, as we all know, and you above all people, right in the heart of the Victorian goldfields area. Uh, and that's where the book really takes off. That's the whole, you know, start of it all. Uh, so uh, to in embarking upon this chat with you all, uh, I'm going to let somebody else tell you a little bit about this book. When I'm on a real tour where I'm there physically and not just virtually, um, I always start with a bit of an audio. Uh, it goes for just four minutes. And it'll be somebody else, as I said, telling you about my book. And that somebody will actually happen to be my husband, Bruce Venables, uh, author and actor extraordinaire, as he always likes me to say, but it's not a lie. And he makes these things for me for the last number of books. And I find them very effective. They put me in the mood. I hope they put you in the mood. So as Bruce tells you about Showtime, uh, I suggest you just go with your imagination, close your eyes, and uh, just let it take over. Go with the flow. Okay? Thanks. Now we'll play the audio. Fingers crossed. My old man said, follow the van. And don't dilly dally on the way. <laughs> Off went the van with me own packed in it. I followed on with me old cock linnet. But I dillied, I dallied, I dallied and I dillied. I lost me way and don't know where to roam. Cos I stopped off to have one at the old red tavern and I can't find my way home. That particular song was written in 1919, just after the conclusion of the Great War. But it relates to a much earlier time. It's the story of a couple who lose their jobs and can't pay the rent and are forced to do a midnight runner. They get a van and pack their belongings 
but there's no room for the woman, and her husband tells her to follow the van. Unfortunately, she stops for a drink and loses her way. It was meant as a humorous look back at hard times in England during the second half of the 19th century, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, with its filthy mines, black smokestacks, undrinkable water, sickness and death. People were horrified by their living conditions and desperate to escape. The situation led to mass migration, especially to Australia, where gold strikes were weekly events, the air was fresh and clean, and newcomers could hope for a better life. Travelling circus stars Will and Max Worthing and their equally talented wives Mabel and Gertie were four such people who left for the land down under and they are the principal players in Judy Nunn's latest novel, Showtime. From small beginnings, they created the Worthing Brothers family which grew into one of the truly great Australian show business dynasties. Showtime is a story spread over four decades, concluding at the end of the Great War. Along the way, you'll meet the divine Dolores, interpretive dancer, Artie and Alfie, twins, acrobats and fabulous magicians, Carlo and Rue, stars of the travelling boxing tents who go on to become entrepreneurs in their own right, plus Italian sopranos, snake charmers, jugglers, tigers, illusionists, and actors extraordinaire. And throughout your travels in Showtime, you'll also meet Emma. But that's me. That's me. That's me finally. Here I am, at long last. Emma Jane Worthing. Max Worthing is my father, and Gertie Smead is my mother. Although everyone knows her as the divine Dolores, creator of the serpentine dance, I was born on February the 1st, 1901, only a month after Federation Day. Ma and Pa had, of course, been here for years before I came along, but I know the whole family history, which I'll reveal to you as we go along. Uh, oh, oh, where do I start? That's I... enough now, Em. What? Uh, oh, oh, yes, of course. Sorry. You'll get your chance later in the book. Showtime paints a picture of one of Australia's most colourful periods, from the gold mining towns and the travelling shows that entertain them, to the major theatres of Melbourne and Sydney, where the theatrical managements fought to outdo each other by turning their travelling shows into huge theatrical events. Glitzy, glamorous, glittering extravaganzas, which they all invariably advertised as the greatest show on earth. Neither plague, nor smallpox, nor the First World War, nor the great Spanish flu pandemic that followed would slow the spread of Australian show business. Australia's master storyteller, Judy Nunn, will take you on a journey you won't ever want to end in her latest blockbuster, Showtime. Isn't it gorgeous, my Brucey? Yeah, I think so. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's very evocative. I find it so. Anyway, I hope it was. I hope it evoked stuff for for you there. Um, yeah, I love the way he does it for me all the time. So thank you, Brucey. Now, as you heard in in the audio, uh, it it the 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 book starts out really. Actually, it's more post. Victorian gold rush. Uh, but during the actual gold rush of the 50s, 60s, uh, of course, uh, Melbourne became, well, I don't think it's necessarily, I need to say, of course, because a lot of people don't realise this, perhaps not even Melbournians, but actually Melbourne was recognised globally as the fastest growing, most cosmopolitan city in the entire world comparative to all others. I mean, they arrived by in the tens and tens and tens of thousands, uh, and Melbourne became on the other side of the river across the Princess, Princess Bridge, a, a tent city uh, where people from then went and grabbed their, their, their pans and their shovels and took off to the goldfields. 
uh, to make their fortune. Um, but what happened later, which is the start of this book, is that the, the knowledge all over the world that this was happening, it didn't fail to reach the, the ears of the entrepreneurs in the UK and also in America. And they thought pretty wisely, well, where those vast numbers of people are congregating, they're going to need entertainment. So out to these as yet undeveloped townships, which did spring up around the place, arrived these traveling shows. Very basic to start with, but believe you me, colorful. I mean, they came out there with everything. There were exotic animals and bawdy, musical, well-established uh, forms of entertainment, particularly in England, um, and variety in vaudeville um, and burlesque. And from America, interestingly enough, very much so minstrelsy. That is blackface entertainment, minstrels, which, of course, these days is rather, you know, dirty word. And I had actually to put in the front of the book uh, a little note about, please, today do not find anything offensive about this, because this was a very popular form of entertainment. And strangely enough, with all the American entertainers that the entrepreneurs brought out here amongst the minstrelsy groups and shows, there were quite a lot of black uh, entertainers, performers, awfully clever uh, people, but they, uh, they actually had to blacken their faces up to be as black as the white people who were performing blackface, which is really um, bizarre when you think about it. And I have a lovely, lovely scene, which I very much like, a comment from a wonderful entertainer called Irving Sales. And he, he is one of the real people in my book my fictional characters as, as I write in all of my historically based fiction, my fictional characters uh, move not only through these real times in our, in our history, but also they bump into real people. And Irving Sales is one of those. And Irving Sales was an immensely clever African-American, a term, of course, in those days that did not apply. So you use the word Negro, which these days you're not supposed to use. But Irving Sales was an immensely popular performer, immensely clever, a great acrobat, singer, dancer, uh, comic, comedian, actor. And uh, he took the world by storm here. Ended up actually marrying uh, an Australian woman, a white woman, settled down here and lived um, until his death. Uh, and uh, he had a great view as I have him professing to one of my fictional characters, which I believe truly was Irving Sales' view. And when my fictional character, Gertie, Gertie Worthing, whom you heard of briefly in the, in the, in the audio, uh, and Gertie says, well, don't you find that a little bit insulting, Irving? You know, the minstrel see the way, it, you know, it, it seems so derogatory to, uh, to you black people, don't you know? And she asks in all innocence, and he says, well, I look at it this way, Gertie, and he says, well, there's, you've got these white people black facing up, being black people, playing the plantation owner and the dandy and the everything like that, and all the white people audiences are laughing because these people on stage they're looking at are rather buffoons, they're rather idiotic. So who do you think this white audience is really laughing at? Are they laughing at the black people or are they laughing at themselves without knowing it, which I thought was a great philosophical comment. I, I adored Irving Sales. Uh, and there are a few comments like that uh, regarding the black entertainers that came out in those very early days. Uh, a fair while afterwards, of course, in 1901, Federation uh, was, Australia suddenly was federated and the first uh, bill passed in Parliament was the Immigration Restrictions Act, which very quickly became known by everybody, not just Joe Blow in the street, but government itself called it the White Australia Policy, which doesn't really need much explaining, does it? Um, and the black performers who had stayed on, these very, very clever people, they lived then in fear. They were either going to be sent home or they couldn't dare get out of the country and go home to see a relative or do something, that they wouldn't then be allowed to get back into the country. Then when minstrelsy faded out, 
this is in the early part of the 20th century, not for any, I think, particularly racially based reason. I don't think people woke up to the fact of, oh, this is not really politically a nice thing to do. I don't think so. I think it just went out of fashion, the way things do in, in all areas, you know. Uh, so a lot of them, instead of going home when the work wasn't as plentiful as it had been, they actually took up many jobs. In, it, it, evidently, a lot of them selling uh, in oyster carts, uh, there were oyster carts all around Melbourne um, and making oyster pies and buying oysters in the shell and even then cleaning the streets, etc. They preferred that to going home because, strangely enough, even though the white Australia policy is nothing to be proud of and there's obviously a great deal of uh, racism in our background as Australians, um, the, the life here was a great deal better for them back in their home country where there would have been whites only, blacks only, all of that, you know. So there's an interesting comment within the book. The other further interesting comment regarding racism that I like in the book is in the theatre, which is my great love, of course, um, racism didn't really exist. People really didn't think about, you know, where you come from, what you look like. The whole, if there was snobbery, most definitely in the theatre, but it was always whether you were talented or not. Who cared what colour you were? It was all about how talented. So I love that. I'm very fond of that. Uh, so anyway, there were these early shows where anything went, exotic animals and, you know, you name it, whatever, which uh, as these touring shows went all through not only the goldfields but all over Australia, uh, they, and they went by ship to, to Western Australia and over to the beautiful old Hobart Theatre Royal Theatre and uh, up to Queensland. Uh, these theatres sprang up, these grand theatres, in these beautiful uh, goldfield townships, of course, where you are, Bendigo, Ballarat, Castlemaine, Maryborough, look at those beautiful towns where the first things that grew out of the were pubs. Miners always need pubs, of course we know that. A post office, naturally, rather grand. And then came the theatres, these beautiful theatres. So the shows thereby became more sophisticated. They suddenly were performing uh, Gilbert and Sullivan comic operas, very popular, um, uh, musical theatre, The Merry Widow, etc., uh, and uh, leading on then to Shakespeare. Oscar Wilde was very popular as time went on. So it, to my mind, it really did. This is, I write very much of the birth of the golden era of Australian theatre. Uh, and Melbourne was most, without doubt, most central to the birth of theatre in this country. Then Sydney immediately took up the bateau as they do, and it became a battle between both. But uh, there you go. Now, the other thing that I want to segue on to now is that uh, in, in writing this book, I've sort of, in a way, come full circle. Uh, I started out writing, my first couple of books were about show business. The first one uh, called The Glitter Game, a satire, very frothy satire, which was great fun, actually. I enjoyed it, um, based around television, television of those days, of the 90s when I wrote it, uh, early 90s. Uh, and then the second one was based upon, as I said, my great love, it was the theatre, it was called Centre Stage. Quite a different book, went through two generations of a family and had a definite, very dark figure to it, a, an element of thriller to it, love that. Then with the third book, I had promised my publishers that I would uh, move into the movie world, okay? So I knew a bit about movies and that too, but I really didn't want to stay put. I write about show business, that sort of thing. So I decided to bring my ancestor of my one day to become movie mogul out on the Bark Henrietta in 1850 and settle in, in the vineyards of South Australia, making wine next door to Dr Penfold near the Grange, you know. So I had to do a lot of research and find out, well, I had to study viticulture and oenology and also the 1850s in South Australia. And I thought, my God, I don't know if I can do this. I stuck basically to the KISS principle before, you know, keep it simple, stupid, write about what you know. But in writing all of the historical element 
uh, of the basis of this book, I just got fascinated. Fascinated. I, I thought, well, gee, I didn't know that. Uh, that's incredible. Really? And the more fascinated I got, the more excited I got. Therefore, I think my excitement then, you know, communicated with a reader and off I went. So that was my next great love affair, historically based fiction. Uh, so I, I, I tell you what, I've got to show you this. It'll probably flare a bit on the screen, but that doesn't matter really, does it? My gorgeous publishers, Peg and Random House, this is one of the reasons why I love them. They did this beautiful map in... In, uh, in publicising or marketing, rather, my 30 years uh, as a storyteller, you know, 16 books uh, from when the, my first book was published. So that's 30 years ago. So, you know, 15, 16 books. And I didn't realise that until they published this map that I'd actually based a book in every state and every territory of this entire country. Oh, well, that's uh, skipping ACT. I somehow couldn't find Canberra remotely inspirational. Uh, but people always ask me, you know, what's your inspiration and all of that in your historic, what, what makes you choose a place or an area, et cetera? Well, I have to say, to, to do an example, I'll give three, um, with a book I wrote called Territory, uh, both based pretty obviously in the Northern Territory, um, it was Darwin itself, the, the place itself, the the city of Darwin, which was my inspiration. I mean, twice annihilated by, uh, first of all, the Japanese bombs in 1942, then 1974 by Cyclone Tracy. So that was the city itself and the people. Then the next book I'd use as an example would be the Maralinga there in South Australia. And that wasn't the place, that was the event that happened there that was uh, a great shame to our country. It was the setup of the ex experimental nuclear testing ground where uh, atomic bombs were detonated in our own country by our government uh, and the British government, uh, thereby causing irreparable harm, not only to the country, to the people, and most, most certainly to our, our first Australians who suffered incredibly because, of course, everybody said, well, that's deserted just in the middle of a desert. Well, it wasn't deserted at all, was it? I mean, it was their home. Uh, and actually, you know, their greatest, with the Uldi Asok, uh, their greatest gathering ground and, and you know, water supply, which the military commandeered. I won't go on any more about that. Um, and the third example I'd like to give you was neither the specific township nor one particular event, it was a book called Heritage based in the Snowy Mountains. Now, this was, I was inspired by a period in our history that actually changed the course of our country. And that was the building of the hydroelectric scheme when uh, post-World War II migrants poured into the country um, and thereby uh, unwittingly uh, sowing the seeds virtually of multiculturalism because the Aussies had never known such a thing. They were suddenly surrounded, the Aussies out there on the snowy. By, they were outnumbered. They were the, the minority. And there they were surrounded by people who couldn't speak the same language, who looked different, who, who ate different food. And the people, the learning curve there was for the Australians, not the migrants. They just wanted to set up a new home and find a new life. So uh, it was a very, very important time in our history, I think. So those are examples about what I love about writing historical fiction and what when people say, you know, why, what makes you set a novel somewhere or what inspires you, there are those different examples of how our country's history continues to inspire me. And now, of course, having come full circle all these years later, and I go back to my first inspiration, writing about show business, sit, thinking I could just stick to the KISS principle and write about what I know. Now I'm writing about what I know, yes, the theatre, but it's very historically based. The novel, uh, as you heard briefly uh, in the audio, is about the Worthing brothers, coming out here with their hugely talented wives and uh, setting up a dynasty 
of theatrical entrepreneurs. Another couple of blokes, Carlo and Rube, who are real, they, they came out of an orphanage in London and ran away and set off with boxing troops throughout the whole of England. Then with the discovery of gold, they also came out here to take up the boxing tents that toured around the gold fields and around everywhere. And then they decided to become entrepreneurs. So you've got these two rising entrepreneurial uh, people and families and production companies. Uh, so suddenly I'm going from those days of post-Victorian gold rush right through things like the Great Depression um, into the Black Plague, the bubonic plague, Black Death, uh, into World War II. And although I'm dealing with theatrical people, they are living through all of these times. Some of them go off to war. Uh, some of them are affected. And the theatre generally, of course, is affected by the plague. Um, so it was very interesting to, to discover that while I'm writing about theatre, which I know and love so well, and I, my first professional production was when I was 12 years old, and I worked regularly in the theatre for 20 years after that before television claimed me, uh, I, I'm writing historically very much so of a way, a time way, way before I was treading the boards. But what I discovered as I went along, which I found very comforting actually, was uh, a strange sense of familiarity. That the theatre, in essence, and the people who tread those boards, they, they actually haven't really changed all that much. They're, so much remains the same. Like, uh, for instance, uh, the superstitions that abound did in those days, in those old vaudeville days, and still do today. Like, for instance, never mention the Scottish play, which I think most people will know the Scottish play is Macbeth. Um, but... Uh, you never mention, unless you're actually playing the, 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 the Shakespeare's Macbeth, um, then of course you have, to, you have to mention it, don't you? But if you're not playing it, you don't mention either the title or any quote from the play, uh, because it will, it will bring about disaster for the show that you're currently doing, uh, because productions of Macbeth have been known to prove disastrous. I mean, people have terrible accidents, the show dies of death and everything. The reason for this being is that evidently Shakespeare in The Witches Upon the, upon the Heath, Double Double Boil and Trouble, Eye of Newt and all of that, I could say that now because I'm not in a theatre, um, was actually a real spell so they say. And I mean, look, it's like pointing the bone really isn't. If, uh, if people believe that, then they're going to be beset by bad luck, aren't they? Uh, the, another one very briefly is uh, don't, if you're going to bring flowers to the theatre, don't put lilies in them uh, because uh, lilies are very much used in funeral wreaths. So that means the death of the show. Um, another one is, uh, is whistling. You don't whistle anywhere. On the, on, you know, in the theatre backstage or dressing rooms. And the reason for this is because in the old days, when they were hauling in great big heavy scrims and backdrops, the stagehands, you know, in the side with these big horses, these big ropes, the blokes up in the flies, which is the area way above the actors, uh, and they're lowering the backdrops. So between the wings and up in the flies, they would communicate with a series of signals. So if anybody else whistled and it was taken as a signal, you could end up with something very heavy landing on your head, which is very practical for those days, but for whatever known reason, uh, it's not practical any longer, but of course it still exists in the theatre. There's all these things and all of those superstitions and also uh, the, the ad age, which has always existed and will always exist, come hell or high water, the show must go on. And the show does go on. Um, I mean, I think one of the greatest examples to use for this is the, uh, the Windmill Theatre, right in the heart of London's West End. And the Windmill Theatre, which is such a prettiest theatre, I, I did an interview there a million years ago when I was promoting the Glitter Game. And they took me over to London, of course, it had sold in England, and they interviewed me in this theatre. Uh, and, uh, oh, it was entrancing, you know, and to read all the reports historically. Now, during the, the London Blitz, throughout the bombing of London, uh, the windmill never closed. They would make an announcement to the audience 
when sirens happen, whoever wishes to leave the theatre, do so now, and the show would go on. And then uh, all the performers would dive down towards the basement, which was like a bunker. Um, but for years and years later, I, mean, I think even when I was in London there all those years ago, they still had the great big neon sign up saying, we never closed. So the show went on. It's what makes it, you know, pretty during these COVID times, pretty drastic for our current theatres. I mean, uh, they they keep, uh, it's awful for a theatre to go dark. And of course, they, they're not allowed to, the show's not allowed to go on, which is very understandable, but they keep a ghost light in the theatre. It's called a ghost light. Uh, and uh, that burns so that the theatre is never truly dark. Uh, and of course, there's the other thing that abounds in the theatre today too. The ghosts, there are always ghosts in theatres. I have two. So yeah, the ghosts are great. Uh, there, there's, at the Princess Theatre in Melbourne, that has one of the most famous ghosts of all time. And he, his name was Frederick uh, Federici. Um, and uh, although he sounds Italian, he was actually brought out from England and he was a tenor, a great singer. Uh, and he was brought out to perform Mephistopheles by J.C. Williamson's productions. Uh, it, this was in, I think, 1904. And this was at the Princess Theatre, which still stands today in Melbourne. Marvellous theatre. I have quite a, a bit based in the Princess in the book. And, uh, and he was performing Mephistopheles, as I said, and the opera went, it was opening night, I hasten to add, opening night. And the opera finishes with Mephistopheles uh, sinking into the bowels of the earth, presumably going to hell, and the stage trap door opens in the middle and this lift takes the performer down, singing the final note of the opera. And he did that. He sang the final note to last applause. Uh, and then uh, as the lift descended to the basement, he, he was only 37 years old and he had a heart attack. He died. And all the other actors, as they took their curtain calls minutes later, he was supposed to have then scarpered up, of course, be on stage for the final curtain. And uh, they took that, they all swore he was there. They swore they were holding his hand as they took their curtain calls. And then they discovered him in the basement, dead. And uh, they took him to the green room and could not revive him. And they say today that there are many staff, theater staff, et cetera, who still see his, his shadowy figure there in evening dress, which I think is a wonderful story. The other uh, ghost that I use in the book, and these have been well do documented, these deaths, whether you believe in ghosts and whether people, you believe people saw them, um, that, that the deaths are documented. The Butte one is Fred at the Theatre Royal in Hobart. Now, the Theatre Royal in Hobart is absolutely gorgeous. It's our oldest, longest, continuously running theatre. Uh, still there today. I've played the Theatre Royal uh, in Hobart twice, and unfortunately I haven't seen Fred. I certainly believe he's there, though. But my good friend Jackie Weaver has, and Fred usually sits up the back of the dress circle. She's, uh, she said she's seen him, and many people say they have. Uh, and Fred actually appears in the book to one of my characters. So I won't tell you about the scene. You have to read the book for that. But, <laughs> um, yeah, the ghosts are another thing that are perennially there in the theatre, which I love. So shall I read my bit now? Uh, okay, now, this is, okay, it's, um, it's 1899, and the big show Bonanza is currently performing at the Princess Theatre in Melbourne. The great Galdini's performance was coming to its conclusion and the grand finale was to be an illusion of vast proportion. So vast, in fact, that it warranted the return of the show's master, Carlo himself. And now, ladies and gentlemen, he proclaimed, a drum roll having heralded both his appearance and the import of his announcement, the denouement for which you have all been waiting. The disappearing tiger. Everything you have read and heard of the great Goldini's mastery is about to unfold before you right here on this very stage. Behold. Another drum roll as he gestured to the OP side, that's opposite drum. Uh, all three of them gestured in unison. Carlo, the great Goldini, 
and the beautiful Cassandra. While from the wings, two stagehands pushed out a trolley upon which sat a large cage. The tiger! Carlo bellowed dramatically and perhaps a little unnecessarily as a wave of gasps rippled through the audience like wind on water. Inside the cage was indeed a tiger, prowling restlessly unsettled by the lights and the drum roll and the general commotion. The tiger, Carlo continued seamlessly, which through the mastery of the great Galdini will disappear before your very eyes that to be returned, dramatic pause for effect, as a kitten. He bashed the front of the cage with his hand, a signal for the animal to growl and slap back with its giant paw, either due to its training or its irritation. No one was sure, least of all Carlo. Or for that matter, the Goldinis, who had bought the beast from a circus that was going bust. They didn't know its background. The big cat obeyed, baring its teeth with a snarl, whacking its paw against the bars, and another ripple of gasps, very audible this time, ran through the audience. A tiger turned into a kitten. Carlo emphatically enthused, pacing downstage, arms outstretched, embracing the whole of the house, a feat never before witnessed on any stage in the world. The music was about to strike up and Carlo was about to leave the stage to the Goldinis and their mime and the impressive display of special effects, but that was as far as he got. There was not a sound from the orchestra pit and the gasps had become far more than a ripple. Both the musicians and the audience were alarmed and with just cause. Behind him, the gate of the cage had slowly swung open. And the tiger stood there facing directly out front, surveying the freedom that beckoned. The Goldinis, posed either side of the cage as they were, exchanged looks of horror. Neither could move, husband and wife simultaneously rooted to the spot. Then the tiger stepped out from the cage, negotiating the one foot drop from the trolley with threatening elegance. The beautiful Cassandra gave a terrified scream and headed for the wings, O.P., while the great Goldini raced for the prompt side, equally terrified, but cursing his wife. He'd never wanted to do this trick in the first place, but she had insisted upon exotic animals being the latest thing and the bigger the better. Cassie could be so dumb. Carlo turned to see what all the ruckus was about. He froze. The tiger was standing centre stage, its eyes following the direction from whence the screams were still audible. The screams stopped. Someone had cat shut Cassie up. The tiger turned its attention to the next distraction, which was Carlo. It took a step towards him, then paused, yellow eyes unblinkingly fixed upon this creature of interest. Those in the front row of the stalls were starting to panic. People were getting up out of their seats, prepared to flee. Then, no, don't go, Carlo said. The voice of calm, but also the voice of compelling authority. There's no cause for panic, I assure you. It's all part of the act. And they believed him. They sat back down in their seats. The musicians in the orchestra pit knew better. Being the professionals they were, however, they did not disrupt the performance, choosing instead to quickly and silently steal away. Carlo was left to put on a show. He faced the tiger. Here, Kitty, he said. Here, Kitty, Kitty. And incredible as it was, there were laughs from the house. A nervous laughs, perhaps, but laughs nonetheless. So far, so good, he thought. Adrenaline coursing through his veins, he had them under control. He took off his tailcoat and, holding it out in front of him like a cape, adopted a matador pose. Toro, he said. Toro, Toro. He didn't dare jiggle the tailcoat as a matador might his cape for fear of agitating the beast. But this was showtime. He had to make things entertaining. The tiger 
totally focused upon Carla, and perhaps intrigued by the coat, started to pad very slowly towards him, intent upon investigating. Carlo, equally slowly, backed away. Toro, Kitty, Toro, he said. The mention of Kitty didn't raise a laugh this time, the audience holding its collective breath, not daring to break the moment. As if in slow motion, man and beast circled the stage. Carlo cautiously backing, the tiger following. Or was it stalking? Was it at any moment about to pounce? At one point, Carlo, in his determination to entertain, gave the coat a small jiggle and the tiger swiped a huge paw at it. A shared gasp from the audience, a very taut moment. No, he decided he wouldn't try that again. But the tiger did seem intrigued by the coat, Carlo realised. Tigers and kittens are very closely related, he said, keeping his voice calm in order not to excite the beast, but making sure at the same time it reached well out into the auditorium. The acoustics at the Princess Theatre were excellent, as he knew. They're all just the same, really, he went on. It's only a matter of size, wouldn't you agree? Here, Kitty, he called once again. The coat still held out at arm's length. Here, Kitty, Kitty. No laugh but you hadn't expected there would be. The circle was nearly completed now. They were back to the cage. Beside him was the open gate. Did he dare? He backed a step or two further. The tiger was beside the open gate now. Yes, he decided he did. Carlo jiggled the coat more vigorously this time, and as the tiger once again swiped at it, he quickly pulled his arms into his chest, the animal's paw missing him by inches. Then, in one swift action, he hurled the coat into the cage and stood facing the tiger, wondering which option would find favour. What's it to be, he thought? The coat or me? But as fate decreed, the tiger automatically followed the source of its interest, the coat. Its circus trainer had used a cape, which the animal had always found irritating. With a snarl, it leapt into the cage. Carlo slammed the gate closed, giving the bars a brief rattle to ensure the catch had firmly clocked, then whirled about to face the audience. Olé, he said, which was another bullfighting term he'd heard somewhere. Good kitty. Adopting full showman pose, he again triumphantly embraced the house. The tiger did not exactly disappear, I grant you, he announced. But as you can see, it did become a kitten. Beat that, he thought. And he took his bows to thunderous applause, while behind him the tiger, now slumped on its belly, ripped into the tailcoat, tearing it to shreds. Backstage, the adrenaline having instantly deserted him, Carlo threw up into a fire bucket. So that just does to go to show you the show must go on and actors, performers will always cover up when there's been a drastic mistake. So that's the end of me. Over to you, Caitlin. Do we have any Q&As or whatever? Thank you so, so much for that, Judy. Um, it's such a... It's such a treat to have a reading by someone who is so clearly an actress as well as an amazing um, the writer. There are some comments already in the chat saying that um, if you haven't already, please do your own audiobooks. Do you do your oh, own audiobooks? Oh, I see. Sorry, I thought that was you. Yeah. Oh, do I? No, I don't. Uh, I, I, every time when I'm out on tour and I do a reading from a book, people will say, oh, well, you're going to do your own audiobooks. I just want you to read me the rest of the book, which is charming, of course. I love it. Well, I'm an actor. I love to perform. Um, but uh, no, I haven't. And I haven't sought to. But funnily enough, I, 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 it's, this is a one-off. I have done something with Showtime audio. Uh, yeah, uh, John Derham is reading the book. He's the narrator. And as narrator, of course, of a good actors, he's a very good actor. We've worked together in the past. Uh, and uh, he performs the characters that, that, that there so beautifully. Um, but I've done something different with Showtime, uh, as well as writing the third person narrative, introducing all the characters and, and therefore the audio John plays these. I actually have another character that comes in. It is one of the offspring of the Worthings. 
It's Emma Worthing. It's Will. Uh, it's uh, Will and Mabel's daughter, Emma. And I bring her in, uh, speaking directly to the reader through the book. Uh, so that's first person. Uh, and um, yeah, she. You heard just a touch of her as a young thing in the audio. I don't do that reading in the book because she's reading as a much older woman. Uh, but so I did read Emma Worthing, and I suggested it myself. There's only about a tenth of the book. She comes in every now and then, but it so it does make this one two readings, uh, two you know, readers, and one of them is me yet yeah, playing Emma. <gasps> This is very good news, I'm sure, for all of us, because that was absolutely <laughs> thrilling and very, very funny. Um, really funny. I love this idea of um, Carlo trying to control the tiger and the crowd at the same time. Oh, yes. And that's what I mean. That's what actors will do. Even, even, and, and the other thing, I mean, adrenaline will allow you to do something mm. like that. I mean, I've never confronted a tiger. <laughs> but, in a, <laughs> but in a very similar vein, if you've got hiccups, before, just before you go on stage, you know, some terrible bout of the hiccups, you get on stage, they'll disappear. Mm. You get back off stage, the hiccups will come back straight away. Yeah. There's a beaut one about uh, now, oh, my God, Phantom of the Opera played Some Mothers Do Have Them, you know, uh, one of your people. Uh, Michael. 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 What was that, Susan? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, he's divine. Wasn't this is, Crawford? oh, dear. A British comedian. Okay. Michael Crawford. Crawford. Crawford, Crawford, thank you. Thank you. First prize to whoever came up with that, Michael Crawford. Well, now, one of my very best friends toured with Michael Crawford as his uh, manager, st tour manager, stage manager. Uh, and when he did his Australian tour, he adored working with her so much that he took her with him to America. And she was his tour manager on an American tour. Uh, Sue, my dear friend, she said Michael Crawford in these are Michael Crawford do concert, Michael Crawford in concert, he would throw up. Seems weird that, uh, that such a professional, such a fabulous singer, as well as a comedian, actor, and everything, he would throw up before he went on stage. He would perform magnificently, all these beautiful, and then he would come back off stage at interval, he'd throw up again. <laughs> uh, then just before he went on, second act, he'd throw up. He performed magnificently, come off stage and immediately throw up. They had a bucket there for him. Isn't that extraordinary? That's terrifying. He must have had to make sure that he had a good dinner before he went on. <laughs> he ran... I don't know. <laughs> he ran out of ammo. <laughs> um, another question that we've got here in the chat, Judy, is um, did you always want to be a writer? Oh, yes. I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was nine. I started writing my first novel. Uh, which was called Dirk, the runaway orphan, because I discovered that Dirk was a name for a dagger and also the name for a boy. So I found that very, very inventive and magical, but it was completely plagiaristic. It was based completely upon uh, R.M. Ballantyne's The Coral Island, which I just adored <laughs> and do to this day. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I, I, I persevered with that for about six months, which is not bad for a nine-year-old. Then I turned 10 and I decided to become an actor. <laughs> so, yeah, I've always known what I wanted to do. They were both things and, uh, you know, they've both come to fruition, which is wonderful. Mm, it's very lucky, really, because neither of them are um, have a... A definite path towards success. Absolutely. You, know? you don't wake up one morning thinking, oh, I think I'll become very rich and famous. I'll write a book. <laughs> no. or, I think I'll become very rich and famous. I'll be an actor. They're dicey decisions. So I have been fortunate, but yeah, I've worked hard a lot too. Of course. Absolutely. It's interesting you say that you <laughs> were um, plagiarizing at age nine. Yeah. Because um, I feel like a lot of writers plagiarize to some extent. I know that you've said that you draw a lot of inspiration from history and from place. Do you also have writers that you draw inspiration from? Uh, no, I don't actually. Uh, I don't say that defensively um, at all. Uh, I, I, my reading, choice of reading is very eclectic. There's no specific genre that I follow. Uh, I, I, I don't go madly into fantasy, much as I can admire fantasy, right? Well, except, excuse me, Mr. Tolkien, I did fall in love in, in my 20s with, uh, with uh, you know, Lord of the Rings. Um, and I don't madly follow crime, although I adored Gorky Park, so there you go, you know. Um, but I read very eclectically, and I admire many authors, and I admire many books, uh, but no, I can't say that I've madly, you know, decided, oh, I think I'll adopt that. 
this is inspiring. Uh, not really, but probably I've, you know, this whole, you know, biosmosis, I probably have taken in things and, but no. Only, only Mr. Ballantyne. <laughs> Just that one time. <laughs> well, I mean, that was total. I mean, look, the kid was an orphan. He ran away. He and he and his mates got wrecked on a desert island. Yeah, I think I can call that Coral Island. Mm, I feel like many people have um, perhaps plagiarised that particular storyline, though. It feels very familiar to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, another thing that also, um, if anyone has um, would like me to shush with my questions, feel free to um, replace me by putting your questions in the chat. And I do have one um, from Michelle that says, what are you reading now? Oh, well, actually, I'm now reading Amor Tal's latest, uh, Lincoln Highway. Uh, I wish I could say an Australian author, but, I, I, you know, I want to back the home team. Um, <laughs> but I did absolutely adore uh, A gentleman, gentleman in Moscow, which is Amor Tal's. So I, I and I'm, I'm 100 pages in, and I must say, actually, I am loving it. Another question that I have while people perhaps are thinking of some more questions is, um, something that a lot of people say about your books is that they, you've written so many, but structurally they are quite different from one another. And often when um, people are very prolific writers, you tend to start to see um, perhaps a formula yes. <laughs> develop. Um, and while I think that your voice is quite strong, each of your books is quite different. I was wondering if you could talk to how you manage to keep coming up with such different books well I just love that whole comment both from the person who who asked it and from you too Caitlin in in sort of you know the diagnosis of uh that I I have a voice that is recognizable but the it's not a formula it's not uh, a feeling of uh change the names of the characters and the the place that it's based and literally sort of write a bit of the same book no, I never want to go down that path. And I'll tell you for why, because I would not be excited. And if I'm not excited, I don't think a reader would be excited. When I sense that in a reader who I have very much enjoyed myself, and I get this feel of repetition, I stop reading that writer. Uh, not because I take great offence, simply because I get bored. Mm -hmm. um, and what I like to do, uh, as, I, as I said when I mentioned this beautiful little map that, that, uh, that the publishers made for me, uh, various areas of historical happenings will inspire me and they might be in different periods. And people, it's the actor in me too here speaking, that people in different periods will speak with different voices. They will be different people. Uh, so that that will create very much a difference. And I also find it excites me to uh, write in a different structure. Like in, in territory, I had two stories melding through and you wonder why, why on earth you're reading about the wreck of the Batavia. Um, and you don't discover until you're over halfway through. The wreck of the Batavia was really something that came ashore. This is in 1629. And a girl who discovers she's been adopted and she's black, although she looks white, and she discovers this and she has studied Indigenous anthropology to discover her own background. She finds this locket which has gone through and the locket was a device that I used to follow through the, the building of the, uh, the, the telegraph line, uh, through the uh, ship direct uh, people that came ashore and interrelated uh, with with uh, Indigenous Australians, and therefore there are suddenly white-skinned, blue-eyed, uh, red-headed uh, uh, Dutch Indigenous people running around. I mean, it was all so exciting. And that was hence I started with the record of Batavia. But you didn't know that until you read halfway through the book. you know. And this one, in bringing Emma in, that's another different thing I've done. So I vary the structure a lot. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Is everyone, everyone following okay? Actually, before you mentioned Territory, um, Val had put in the chat, um, restructure, I loved what you did in Territory where the present and past stories were interwoven back and forth, but never became confusing, which is actually um, very difficult to do. Um, I've got a couple more questions for you from lots of different people. Um, the first one is, do you plan your books or do you let them evolve as you're writing them? Oh, 
a, a mixture. It depends very much upon the book. Uh, like, for instance, now I could quote to Marilinga and Heritage both had a reveal. Uh, I knew where I was going at the end of that book because there was going to be a revelatory, my God, discovery, you know. Uh, so uh, I had to be very careful as I wrote it. Uh, and it does become quite an art. You think, oh, dear, is that going to give it away? Are they going to guess it there, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, uh, so uh, the, the characters will still do their own thing and take me certain ways. I know so many authors say this, but the characters do take over. But in examples like those, where you are walk, working towards uh, a really eye-opener end, you've, you've got to map out things as you go. But I don't pre-map it out. Things will happen, but I keep very aware as I'm going. With other ones, uh, like, for instance, a book I wrote called Cal, based in Kalgoorlie, gold mining in Kalgoorlie, I was going to go right up to open plan mining um and uh, as it is virtually today or when it was published a fair while ago but i ended the book at the end of world war one when the diggers came home from the war and discovered that the italians had their jobs and there was a real race riot in kalgoorlie so i mean i got rid of a couple of generations by that time <laughs> i got so carried away with writing the book i thought it's going to be too long anyway it'd be a thousand page novel so it was wise mm -hmm. Um, another question kind of linked to that, I suppose, um, extensive research that you bring into your book. Um, Robbie has asked, given that you write historical fiction that depends on a great deal of research, have you considered writing narrative nonfiction? Oh, no, to write about, no, I haven't at all, actually. Uh, no, uh, I tell you for why, uh, I don't think my creative sense would be satisfied doing that. My discovery of all these fascinating aspects of our history and the research involved would absolutely fascinate me. But I mean, heavens, I think it's fairly much on display here that I am an actor <laughs> as mm -hmm. well as a writer. And my great love is creating characters and their voices. And uh, not only their, uh, who they are and their relationships, but uh, I, I use, do use a lot of dialogue, actually. I don't know if you've noticed that, anybody who's read my books. And uh, I, I love that. I love the way they relate and speak to each other. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I wrote mm. nonfiction. Mm. They are very character-driven books, for, yeah. especially for historical fiction. Yeah. Because a lot of historical fiction is, is more sort of plot, not that they're not plot-based, but they are very, very character-driven, I would say. Yeah, yeah I, so that makes my sense. books are very character-driven. Yeah. Mm, mm. um, let me just scroll through these many, um, many, many questions. Um, how do you go about your research and is it time-consuming? Yeah. Oh, my goodness, yes. Research is, is definitely time-consuming given, you know, the, the subject material that I, I take on. Uh, and uh, I will go, of course, to the place where my book is set several times and talk to local people and discover who the historians, local historians are. Uh, very, very much big kudos to you guys. First place I go to in these particularly these regional areas uh, is the library. Uh, not only are librarians fantastic in the way that they'll point me to the, the books that would be really helpful. Uh, but very often uh, in many areas, librarians are indeed historians themselves. They, they know the area, they, they know the people. So even if they can't give me much, you know, if they haven't been there for that long and give me their own historian sort of view of the place, they can point me at the people who will. So first port of call is always a library. Thank you. We did not pay Judy to say that, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a lovely place to end. I'm sorry for the people whose questions we haven't got quite gotten to, but um, we could probably go on forever, I feel. Um, and we're pretty much out of time. So um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Judy. It's been so lovely. Um, really appreciate your time tonight. Um, also, Thank you uh, to Penguin for organizing this event with us. It's been really a real privilege. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming. Um, to purchase a copy of Showtime, uh, we've popped a link in the chat um, and that will take you to Penguin's website. 
It's also um, an especially great time to be supporting our local bookstores, uh, many of whom have been hit hard by lockdowns. Um, I'm told that Dimmick Bendigo have also been gifted some signed book plates for their copies of Showtime. So if you are in Bendigo, it might be worth checking that out. Um, if you've enjoyed tonight and are keen for some more author talks, you can head to Goldfields Library's website to check out our October online author chats, including bestseller author and journalist Chris Hammer, who is going to be in conversation with author Ben Hobson on the 20th of October to talk about Chris's new book, Treasure and Dirt. Um, thank you again, everyone, for being here tonight. It's been so lovely. Um, and thank you again to Judy for such a wonderful presentation. Congratulations on the publication of Showtime. Thank you, thank, you. Thank, thank you, Thank you, Bendigo. Thank you, thank you. everybody, for turning mm -hmm. up. You're absolutely gorgeous. Thank you, everyone. Oh, isn't that lovely? So many messages coming up. You're able to see those? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, I've been. Good. Well, it's lovely. Thanks so much. Absolutely terrific. Oh, thank you, Judy. It's been really lovely. I've had great fun. Thank you. I'm glad. It's very nice to hear. Very successful, Judy. Have, have you done many Zoom talks? Oh, how many have I done, Karen? This is the fourth. This is the fourth. Yeah, yeah. No, really wonderful. It gives a different sort of interaction for people who come along and it's, it's really quite nice. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, yeah. I really did. Actually, I'd like to say I think this is the one I've had the most fun with. Oh, oh. isn't that great? Yeah, I think <laughs> do you Would say you that like to all the libraries, that? Judy? No, I do not. <laughs> no, I'm a very, very honest person, aren't I, Karen? I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> no, Thank you. Me. It has been super fun. It, it was lovely to see that that people were really happy to be here and meet you and hear you in, in a smaller setting like that. Really great. Yeah. yeah. Well, I found it very warm and fuzzy and I felt I've got my audience made me feel good. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Thanks heaps, Judy. And Karen. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> she looks after me. I couldn't yeah. look without her. Kim, uh, Kim, we've still got Kim Mayer here. Do you mind if we ask you just one very last question? Sure. Um, Kim, would you like to unmute yourself and ask Judy yourself? Judy, I believe you wrote a couple of children's books. Oh, yes, I wrote. I actually, well, I co-wrote two children's books. I in the... No, no. Before um, that, there was The Riddle of the Trumpler and The Challenge of the Trumpler. Uh, I don't think I'll ever take on two other women and write in a troika. It was quite, uh, <laughs> oh, it was ghastly. Uh, but they were very successful books. And after that, to free myself from this troika, um, I, uh, I wrote two books. Yes, I in the Storm and I in the City. I very much enjoyed doing them, yeah. They are impossible to get. Yes, they are, unfortunately. Scholastics, um, yeah, they did very well and they were out for a long time. The only thing you can do is, to do, have you got in touch with Scholastics and tried to? I haven't tried Scholastics, but we have a, um, a, a guy in town here, Nigel, I think he's still about, um, secondhand and rare books and everything else, and he will often hunt things up for me. Um, but yeah, he can't find them. So I will try Scholastics. Thank you. I like to have a whole body of work of an author that I've followed since day dot. So I receive your books as either my birthday or Christmas presents, depending on when they come out. It's my birthday in a week. And <laughs> so Showtime's showing up exactly on time. Oh, um, that's lovely. And unfortunately for me, I read your books until I'm baggy eyed and sleep <laughs> So then as you family. enjoy them, who cares about baggy eyes? Yeah, I don't care, especially lockdown. No one sees me anyway. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> my family are all like, she's read it already. But there you go. So I will keep hunting and I will definitely try Scholastics. Thank you very much. Um, oh, good on you. Thank you. Have a crack at that. Good girl. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we, we better let you go and have your tea, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much and best wishes with the book. Thank you very much indeed. Bye Thanks, bye. Judy. Bye.